Uh, it's nice to be here for another year. Um, the Bathio lecture is done every year and uh, we take turns in presenting uh, something to you. Um, I chose for this year to talk about a rare disease that is not so rare in Cyprus and it's called familial amyloid polyneuropathy. So let's take things from the beginning. What is amyloidosis? What is the amyloid? The amyloid is an abnormal protein and because it looks like cellulose or starch, that's why it's called amyloid. In Greek, amylo means starch, like everything in medicine. Most of the things in medicine comes from the Greek words. So we know about the amyloid since for a long time, um, since Rudolf Virchow uh, found out about it in the, uh, in the 18th century. So we've known, it, known about it for a long time, but it seems that we don't know enough. There's many types of amyloidosis. I'm just going to mention four or five. The primary type is the one that we find in multiple myeloma or Waldenstrom's. The secondary type is what we find in autoimmune disease. You can find it localized, you can find it uh, with Alzheimer's disease or CJD. But we are only going to talk about today the hereditary type. So the hereditary type, we have amyloid that is derived from a special protein called transthyretin. So familial amyloid polyneuropathy or hereditary amyloidosis, that's a modern term, it's rare, it's genetic, and it's endemic in Cyprus. It affects multiple organs by the amyloid deposition on them and it's derived from the transthyretin. The transthyretin is a plasma protein that's being produced in the liver. So what it does, transthyretin, is that it carries T4 and retinol. But new evidence show that it might have more complex um, uh, functions as well, like neuroprotection. We're not very sure about that yet, but there's some evidence about that. Amyloidosis starts usually in the third or fourth decade of life and without treatment is fatal within 10 years of onset. So it starts with a genetic mutation. The mutation causes a variant of transthyretin, the protein. So the protein is being misfolded. And this misfolding causes amyloid production. And then the amyloid circulates within the uh, circulation. It's being deposited to various organs and causes dysfunction. There's more than 100 mutations of transthyretin. And each mutation creates a different phenotype. So it could be uh, predominantly neurological features or predominantly cardiological fix, uh, features or mixed. Different genotypes also affect the age of onset. So the VAL30MET is the most common genotype and it's the only genotype that we have here in Cyprus. The VAL30MET is also called the Portuguese type because 90%, 99% of the Portuguese patients have this mutation. And it's the only mutation in Cyprus. So that's a relation that we're going to see later why this happens. The disease is inherited and it's, it's been transmitted with the autosomal dominant uh, inheritance with incomplete penetrance. And it's interesting to see that some patients that have inherited the disease from their mother have earlier onset. So you can find it worldwide, despite its rarity. You can find it anywhere in the world. It might be sporadic, it might be endemic. Endemic, you can find in Japan, Sweden, Portugal, and of course Cyprus. And if you look at the genotypes in Europe, it's very interesting, like we said, the Portuguese type with uh, uh, Cyprus uh, type mutation. So I'm going to take a small break here and take you back to a short history break about the Crusades. Amyloidosis in Cyprus is called the Crusaders disease. The Crusades, for those of you who, are not, who don't know, they were a series of religious wars started from Europe in order to free uh, Jerusalem and the Holy Land from the Muslim, Muslim rule. 
So it started with this guy. This is Richard the Lionheart, if you know him. He was the king of England at the time. He was accidentally found in Cyprus because someone stole his bride, Berengaria. So um, he, they brought her to Cyprus, so he had to invade Cyprus and actually married Berengaria in Cyprus. He was the only, uh, you, uh, only king of England ever to be married outside the UK. That's a bit of history for you. So Richard the Lionheart took Portuguese soldiers from Portugal and brought them with him, and they camped in Cyprus. So we think, or at least the story, story says, that wherever they camped, they left their genes. So it's interesting, although it's endemic in Cyprus, there are specific areas in Cyprus that are related to the disease, like Kyrenia area, Pachna village near Limassol, Paphos, and certain extended families. So back to science now. What does it do? Of course it affects the eyes, that's why we're here, but we'll get to that later. It can have uh, cardiac problems, so uh, conduction blocks, arrhythmias, um, cardiomyopathy, GI tract problems, quite severe, nausea, um, vomiting, severe diarrhea and loss of weight, carpal tunnel syndrome, renopathy, but of course um, uh, neuropathy. So amyloidosis is predominantly a neurological disease and mostly a peripheral sensory motor neuropathy. It starts with difficulty in walking, uh, progresses into re requiring help to walk, and then wheelchair bound or even bedridden if there's no treatment. Autosomic neuropathy is very important as well, causing hypotension, diarrhea, urinary retention, etc. And of course, CNS manifestations like ataxia, dementia, and stroke episodes. Usually, there might be a delay in diagnosis, especially in areas that the disease is not endemic. That's because it's rare. You, nobody teaches you about amyloidosis in medical school or during your specialty training. That's because it's so rare. So many times, it's misdiagnosed with other peripheral uh, neuropathies. So if you practice medicine anywhere in the world and you have a patient who's suspicious, with a uh, uh, background from endemic countries, you should consider that and confirm the diagnosis with genetic testing or tissue biopsy. So we used to do liver transplantation and that was the treatment of choice during the 90s. If you think that transthyretin was produced in the liver, then the idea was change the liver and you get a healthy transthyretin, okay? And it did work for quite, quite a bit. So there is data from the World Transplant Registry that confirms that the patients were living longer and the peripheral neurological progression was stopped. But it didn't stop the eye problems, it didn't stop the CNS problems. In the contrary, we had more patients with eye problems. Why was that? They were living longer. So we extended the life expectancy. So they were getting eye disease and many of them were going blind. So the assumption is that transthyretin was produced by the, from the eyes and from the brain, especially the choroidal plexus. So within the eye, the place, the site of production is the retina the retinal pigment epithelium specifically, and the ciliary pigment epithelium, which is on the ciliary body. From there, the amyloid transfers everywhere within the eye, sits there and creates problems. Ocular involvement is very important because if you leave it undiagnosed, it can lead to severe complications and it can blind our patients. Overcoming that is very important for the quality of life of our, of our patients. They already have a lot of systemic problems. Uh, reduced vision is the last thing they need. So from front to back, you can find amyloid anywhere. And just to remind you how it works, you have a light source and it has to penetrate the media that have to be clear in order to focus in the retina and from there the optic nerve takes the image and we focus by seeing the image with our brains, okay? Now, if you have your vitreous full of amyloid, 
then the picture cannot be transmitted and then you have reduced vision. If you get glaucoma and that destroys your optic nerve, the image cannot be transmitted as well and you go blind. So that's what amyloidosis does. And there's a sequence of events that happens before, before that happens. Most importantly, the vitreous opacities from amyloid and glaucoma are the most serious complications. So we start from front. Abnormal vessels on the conjunctiva, they're not very specific and it's difficult to see. Severe dry eye is very important. You have dry eye because the amyloid sits on the lacrima gland and stops it from producing tears. But also, this is a neuropathy. There are problems from uh, the cornea and the autonomic neuropathy affects the cornea as well. So if you get severe dry eye, then you're at risk of getting a wound on your cornea. If you get a wound on your cornea, you might get melt. If you get melt, you get a hole, okay? And a hole means that you have neurotrophic keratopathy with cornea perforation. That's very serious. You can go blind, you can even lose your eye from this if you don't prevent it. This is the hallmark of amyloidosis though. You can see this is a pupil and it should be round. It's not round. You see these little white spots? That's amyloid and it sits on the pupillary margin. So it starts like this, it's very, very subtle. So you have to look for it. You won't find it in a routine examination. You have to very specifically look for amyloid. It starts like this, and then slowly it progresses. So you can see the white line uh, uh, on, the, on the pupil, as well as cataract in this patient. And finally, what happens is that the iris becomes scalloped, or the so-called fringed pupil. And this is very pathognomonic, okay? There's nothing else in ophthalmology that can cause this picture. And once, once you see this picture, you have to know this patient is very prone to glaucoma, and glaucoma is a blinding complication. And I found this very interesting drawing in the literature. It was done by a Portuguese guy, of course, ophthalmologist, and um, it was published in the 1950s. So at that time, there weren't any cameras, there weren't any uh, technology to, to look at the iris. So it was prominent even with the naked eye. So the second important deposition is in the vitreous body. And it looks like glass wool deposit if you look at it. So if you look at the color picture, um, the white, white parts are the amyloid. And if you look at the ultrasound scan, so that's the ultrasound scan, it should be black. So fluid is black, yeah? So the white parts are actually the amyloid fibrils that sit in the vitreous, causing severe reduction in vision, and it happens gradually. So amyloid really loves vitreous. So wherever there's vitreous, that's where it's going to go. And that's because of its biochemical properties, because it likes specimen membranes. So that's the picture that you saw before, more clearly. And look at this. This is an OCT scan. That's where technology comes to help us. So the OCT scans the retina. And what you can see are the retina layers, okay? And this is a normal fovea, the normal retina. And all those white dots are amyloid. You don't usually find that. So that's from amyloid um, deposition in the vitreous. And we said that it comes from the retinal pigment epithelium. So that's the line there, the bright line. So it, it's being produced there and slowly finds its way up to the surface of the retina. And you can see these little spikes, that's amyloid again. So that's one of our patients with advanced uh, deposition. That's another patient of ours. You can see the, the picture is hazy. That's not because we didn't focus well. That's because there's amyloid in the middle. And you can barely see the optic nerve there. Thankfully, it's healthy. But if you see a few months later, there's no view, and the patient is essentially blind from that. But the good news is that we can fix it, okay? We can remove the vitreous. And it's done by an operation. That's, that's a probe there. And the white stuff that you see, that's amyloid. 
So with the probe, this is a cutter. It cuts and it aspirates, okay? Again, that should be transparent. It's white because there's amyloid on it. So we remove the amyloid slowly and the vision is restored because we restore the visual pathway. We clear the media, okay? Uh, it's interesting because in the past, we used to aim to remove to remove the whole vitreous so that uh, it doesn't think, so that amyloid doesn't come back. It will come back because it's, it keeps producing, okay? So there's a patient that had vitrectomy and now you can see, vit you can see amyloid in the vitreous cavity. So what we do now is we do an incomplete vitrectomy. We leave vitreous in the periphery and we said that amyloid like loves vitreous, so it goes and sits in the remaining vitreous and it leaves the posterior pole intact. So the, uh, the vision is, uh, is preserved. So you can find it in the anterior lens surface and that's very characteristic as well, it looks like a target. And also on the zonules. If you remember from your anatomy, the lens sits on its place with some strands they are called the zonules. So the amyloid sits on the zonules, weakens them or breaks them. So the result of that is that the lens becomes wobbly and unstable. And you can see it after a while, it drops. So it's, it's been dislocated. On this picture, you can easily see the fringed pupil as well. This is about one of our amyloidosis patients. So this again is fixable, but it needs surgery, okay? So that's the lens, that's droopy. Retinal vessel abnormalities is not very common. This is one of our patients that had, uh, you can see the vessel tortuosities near the, um, uh, the arrows, and you can see some white white deposits around the vessels. Again, that, again, that is uh, amyloid, and it could cause the vessels to block. And that is serious, like this patient. He had a retinal, central retina vein occlusion, and you can see the dot and blot hemorrhages everywhere in uh, the retina. And if you look closely, there are some shadows. The shadows are amyloid, okay? Unfortunately, this patient had a very severe occlusion, didn't respond to treatment and had a very bad outcome visually. But the most common cause of blindness is actually glaucoma. Now glaucoma in these patients is very aggressive, it's difficult to treat and it can develop very rapidly. Normal glaucoma patients might take 20 years to go blind. Amyloidosis patients with glaucoma, it's gonna happen much, much sooner than that. Again, it's highly associated with fringed pupils. So if you see a fringed pupil, then they need to be screened for glaucoma. Just a reminder about what glaucoma is. If your angle doesn't work properly, then the fluid cannot be drained outside the eye. So it accumulates inside the eye, causes high pressure. The high pressure is being transferred to the optic nerve and it causes damage. That damage is called cupping, okay? And you can see the, the first picture is the normal uh, cup. It progresses slowly, slowly taking over the optic nerve causing severe atrophy. And that causes peripheral visual uh, defects that progress with time. They end up in tunnel vision and complete blindness in the end if you don't catch it early. So screening is essential because the patients will go blind without any symptoms. They're not going to tell you they are in pain, it's not going to go red, there's not, there are not going to be any symptoms at all. So you need to screen them in order to prevent glaucoma. Why is glaucoma so aggressive? In glaucoma, you have two components, high pressure and vulnerability of the optic nerve. And that's what combines the glaucoma disease. In these patients, the pressure goes very, very high. Normal range is 10 to 22, reminding you. So it goes much more than 30, 40, sometimes 50. Why? Because there's two mechanisms. The amyloid sits on the drainage channel, on the Schlems canal, and it stops the outflow. But it's, it also sits outside on the episclera uh, uh, vessels. So 
it increases the episclerar venous pressure, so it stops the drainage from, outside, from the, the fluid to go out of the eye. On top of that, the optic nerve is very susceptible. Why? Because there's a huge issue with the autonomic, uh, autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is very important for the autoregulation of the optic nerve, especially their blood supply. So their optic nerves are hemodynamically in unstable. So you have a vulnerable optic nerve with very high pressures, and that's why we get so severe disease. So it's difficult to treat medically. We always try drops first, but most of the times they don't work. We can try laser, but that usually doesn't work as either. So most of our patients will need surgery with glaucoma. And there's various options, but again, with time, We've changed our approach. We used to do trabeculectomy. Trabeculectomy is the golden standard for glaucoma surgery. We don't do that anymore because uh, the recent studies have shown that they're very short-lived, so it's not worth the trouble. And now we do tube surgery. What does that do? We put a, a tube in the eye, okay, to drain the fluid outside the eye. So there's good evidence for AMED valve, and that's what we used to put until recently. There's a new valve now called the pole tube that has some benefits, and I'm going to show you a video about that. We've tried it in five of our patients with very good results now. So you establish the flow, okay, outside the eye by opening an incision in the conjunctiva. So that's the conjunctiva, okay? And you need to open wide so that we, you place the plate there. We measure, so that's the tube, it's quite large. So we prime the tube, make sure it's patent, and then we put a stitch through because we want to restrict the flow. We don't want too much flow, we want a little bit of flow, okay? So we put a stitch on the sclera and we, we fix the uh, tube there. Now the tube because it's large, it goes underneath the muscles, underneath the superior rectus and the lateral rectus. And you pass your stitch through those small holes and then you push it back in its place. That's where we enter the eye with a very small needle, adjust the tube to the uh, length that we want and we just put it in. Okay. So it goes in and you establish the flow from the anterior chamber to the plate. And from there, the circulation will take care of the rest. We fix the tube so that it doesn't move. And this is pericardium patch graft. This is tissue from pericardium uh, cut to appropriate size and stitched on, uh, on top of the tube. If you don't do that, the tube will erode the surface and there will be exposure and risk of infection. So that's our modern technique for glaucoma surgery. So prevention of blindness is obviously very important in these patients. And the only key is the regular follow-up, is prevention. So we have guidelines about how to prevent the ocular disease, and that goes for every system, but for the eyes, it's about six to 12 months. To be honest, sometimes it's much uh, more frequent than that. But we are now in a new era. It's a very exciting era, because we have new therapeutic, therapeutic strategies. And reminding that the liver produces the transuretin, the transuretin is being misfolded, and then uh, creates amyloid and then amyloid is being deposited. So there's drugs that interfere with that cycle. And the first drug that was actually uh, FDA approved is Tafamidis. And Tafamidis actually stabilizes the tetramer structure. So it stops the neurological um, uh, progression. Interestingly, the Tafamidis was found in vitreous, so it can penetrate the eye, which is very interesting. But the, at the moment, there's no studies that it benefits the eye. But it's, it's, very, it's very promising that it, uh, uh, we can find it inside the eye. 
But the exciting era is now gene therapy. And we have various uh, RNA targeting uh, therapies, which is I find very exciting. Just to remind you of the basics, how the a gene is expressed, you have the DNA, and the DNA, you have subscript, uh, transcription to RNA, and then the RNA is being translated into protein. And these are the two points where the new drugs work. And the first drug, we were, which we are very excited with, is patisiran. Patisiran is a small interfering RNA, that's SI RNA. And what it does, it turns off the production of the gene that is responsible. Now, what's exciting with patisiran is that it was the first ever MRI, mRNA drug to be uh, released. And it, was, it actually hit the news. And I interestingly read about it in a, um, a business magazine because they were uh, asking people to invest <laughs> uh, the, and buy shares in that, uh, in, in that company. Um, I, find it, I find it very interesting that these new things happen, these new developments happen. So this drug, does wonders for the neurological uh, issues, so they stopped doing uh, liver transplant now. But unfortunately, it doesn't affect the eye, which is sad. The other drug that we have does gene silencing by stopping the translation. It's um, inotocin and eplontocin, again approved by the FDA. And we are waiting for a new gene therapy, the gene editing, which, which is a new technology that will edit the gene and we, they will have a single administration and possibly cure them, hopefully cure them. So what about the eye? What's happening with the eye then? We have all these exciting treatments and nothing affects the eye. The problem is that the drugs are designed to stop the liver production, which makes sense, but we need to think about um, delivering these drugs inside the eye. Now for other diseases like age-related macular degeneration, in those cases, the drugs cannot reach the eye either. And what we do is stick a needle and put the drug inside the eye, inside the vitreous. So you reach the vitreous and you reach the retina. And these uh, drugs, uh, they, they do wonders for age-related macular degeneration, for diabetes. So why not deliver these new gene therapies into the eye? And that was always my question um, to, to various people. And thankfully, only last month, this came out. So in Japan, uh, scientists have tried to inject SI RNA uh, drugs in the vitreous. Of course, it's only in rabid eyes still, but that's a lot of progress that's waiting for us for the eye complications. So very excited to hear how that goes. So in summary, familial amyloid polyneuropathy is a rare disease, but not so rare if you live in Cyprus. The problem is that we were never taught about this. We had to learn ourselves and it's an ongoing process. We learn with our patients as our patients go and through their journey that becomes our journey as well. We learn with and from our patients and we learn from other specialties as well. And we are very proud to be a referral center at Pantheo for the ocular complications. Um, our main referral uh, site is the Institute of Neurology and Genetics, but we get referrals from neurologists and ophthalmologists from all over Cyprus. We have a multidisciplinary team for glaucoma, vitro retinal surgery, and everything that they need. And we're very proud to be part with the Neurological Institute in um, uh, original trials and drug trials for the Patisiran and the Inotocin and would like to thank at this uh, point, especially the Institute of Neurology and Genetics, but special thanks to Professor Theodoros Kiriagidis and uh, Dr. Eleni Papanigolaou for honoring us with their trust and um, giving us the opportunity to deal with this very exciting um, subject. 
I always like to finish my talks to medical students with a piece of advice, a piece of advice that I wish someone would give that to me <laughs> when I was a medical student. Um, the best advice I can give you is be passionate. Be passionate with whatever, whatever you do, but especially your work, okay? And find inspiration. I personally find inspiration in two places. The first is our patients, very inspiring patients. Some of them, not all of them, but most of them. And of course, you find inspiration in your team. So you have to find an enthusiastic team and surround yourself with people that share your passion for anything you do. So that's my advice to you. And at the end, I would like to invite you to our conference uh, later this year in April. You are all welcome to come. Some of your fellow students will present as well. You are welcome to come and attend and uh, see more of ophthalmology if you are interested. Thank you.